The Starship program entered a critical testing phase on August 6, when SpaceX's Super Heavy Booster 9 underwent a static fire test with the water deluge system in operation. Propellant loading into the booster began at 1 p.m. local time last Sunday. Within an hour, SpaceX filled the oxygen tank completely and the methane tank partially with propellants. Engine chill began immediately after that, during which cryogenic propellants are allowed to flow into the engine components to cool them down to prevent thermal shock, when the main cryogenic propellants are injected under extreme pressure into the combustion chamber for ignition. The Fire Extinguisher and Detonation Suppression System, or FireX, designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, was activated first followed by the water deluge system, which releases thousands of liters of water onto the launch mount to deflect the energy of the 33 Raptor engines of Super Heavy. Booster 9 then lit all 33 Raptor engines, however, four of them shut down early in the test. The static fire test was originally intended to last 5 seconds, but lasted only 2.74 seconds. SpaceX hasn't revealed what caused the engines to shut down prematurely. The new Raptor startup sequence SpaceX implemented during the static fire test could be a potential cause of the issue. The engine issue during the test raises a few questions about the reliability of the current version of Raptor engines. During the first integrated flight test, eight engines on Booster 7 shut down during various stages of flight, and now even after months of development and test fires at the McGregor test facility, the Raptor is still facing the same issue. CEO Elon Musk has said they are working on version 3 of Raptor engines, which will address the problems occurring in current Raptor version 2 engines. The last time SpaceX lit all 33 engines of the Super Heavy was on April 20, during the first integrated test flight. SpaceX has made considerable progress since the inaugural launch attempt, which caused severe damage to the orbital launch mount and associated ground hardware. The installation of the water-cooled steel plate deluge system is one of them. The result of this new water deluge system was the production of an immense amount of steam instead of the giant dust cloud that is usually formed after a static fire test. This side-by-side -side comparison of Booster 7 and Booster 9 static fire tests shows us how well the deluge system prevented the formation of the rock tornado and how quickly the steam cloud dissipated compared to the dust cloud following the test. These aerial images captured by RGV aerial photography show the condition of the launch pad after the Booster 7 and Booster 9 static fire tests. The pad has hardly any burn stains after the Booster 9 static fire. The launch pad sustained substantial damage during the April launch attempt due to the lack of a deluge system, including the bursting of concrete blocks that showered down debris for kilometers surrounding Starbase. That is one area of concern being looked at by the Federal Aviation Administration as SpaceX seeks a new Starship launch license. It's likely that SpaceX gathered a ton of data during the Booster 9 static fire test about how the upgraded launch pad and water deluge system performed in order to give the FAA the data they required as part of the launch licensing procedure. Another issue yet to be resolved is the failure of the automated flight termination system to immediately destroy the rocket when it tumbled out of control during the April 20 test flight. There was about a 40-second delay between the initiation of the system and the rocket breaking apart. This time lag posed no safety issues with the rocket safely offshore, but it was unacceptable for a system that is supposed to terminate flight almost immediately. Several days after this launch attempt, Elon Musk said the problem could be solved with a longer detonation cord to ensure the propellant tanks are fully unzipped rapidly. However, he acknowledged that working through this issue with the FAA may take some time. Following the static fire test, SpaceX lifted Booster 9 off of the orbital launch mount and sent it back to the build site for final inspections, repairs, and upgrades before the next orbital flight test. SpaceX needs to figure out what was wrong with the four Raptor engines that shut down prematurely during the static fire test. They may either fix the engine issues or replace the engines with new ones. One of the significant upgrades Booster 9 will receive in the coming weeks is the installation of the hot staging interstage on top of the forward dome. SpaceX announced in June that it plans to include hot staging on the Starship, which entails starting the upper stage's engines just before stage separation, while it is still connected to the booster stage. This will potentially increase the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting won't be interrupted during flight. An interstage test article is being prepared for structural stress tests at SpaceX's Massey's test facility, several kilometers from Starbase. The ring features customized truss work with openings for the Starship's exhaust to escape during hot staging. If the test article passes the structural test, a similar interstage ring will be installed on Booster 9. If not, SpaceX will have to redesign the interstage, delaying the next orbital launch. Booster 9's partner, Ship 25, which completed a six-engine static fire test in June, 
was moved back to the production site on August 6. Ship 25 will continue its preparations at the production site, including finishing heat shield installation, engine inspections, and other minor upgrades. When Booster 9 and Ship 25 are back at the launch site the next time, SpaceX will stack them on the launch mount to conduct a full-stack wet dress rehearsal. A successful wet dress rehearsal will be followed by the integrated flight test. Elon Musk estimates a 50% chance that the next flight will result in the Starship achieving orbital velocity. NASA's Artemis III mission, scheduled to launch in 2025, aims to make history by landing humans on the moon since 1972. Speaking at an August 8 briefing, Jim Free, NASA's associate administrator, said that the mission still has a formal launch date of December 2025, but added that he is monitoring potential delays in hardware needed for the mission, including the Starship Lunar Lander that is slated to transport astronauts from a lunar orbit to the surface of the moon and back. He expressed concern over the progress SpaceX is making on its Starship vehicle and said that the challenges with Starship development could push back the launch of Artemis III until 2026. According to Free, if that's the case, NASA may launch a different mission to the moon in 2025, which might not involve a crewed landing. Starship 28, which recently completed two cryogenic proof tests at SpaceX's Massey's facility, was moved back to the Starbase production site on August 5. The next step for Ship 28 will be Raptor installation, followed by static fire testing. A brand new liquid oxygen turbopump arrived at the launch site last Monday. The pump will be installed on the oxygen tank side of the tank farm, and when combined with the other pumps already there, it will speed up the process of loading liquid oxygen into the launch vehicle. A large horizontal water storage tank that will store the water required for the deluge system arrived at Starbase last Wednesday. The deluge system had two large and four smaller horizontal tanks in place, and they were functioning as intended. The newly delivered tank was installed near the larger tanks, increasing the deluge system storage capacity. The final corner section of the fifth level of the new mega bay was installed on August 5th. When complete, the building will have seven levels in total. The two SpaceX ground antennae that track starships during flight were recently decommissioned. It appears that SpaceX intends to replace the current antennae with new ones. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Russia has launched its first lunar mission in almost 50 years. The Luna 25 spacecraft, also known as the Luna Globlander, lifted off atop a Soyuz 2.1B rocket from the Vostochny Cosmodrome on Thursday, August 10. The Soyuz rocket launched the spacecraft into a circular near-Earth orbit with an altitude of 200 kilometers. About an hour after liftoff, Fregat upper stage of the rocket fired its engine for the first time to send the lander on a trajectory to the moon. After the second burn, at a distance of about 3,000 kilometers from Earth, the spacecraft separated from the upper stage and began its journey to the moon using its own engines. It should take roughly five days for the spacecraft to reach the moon. After arriving in the vicinity of the moon on August 16, the spacecraft's main engine will burn for the first time to enter the lunar transfer orbit. The lander will spend the next few days in a circular 100-kilometer lunar orbit, while Mission Control selects one of three proposed landing locations near the lunar south pole. Luna 25 is to set down on the floor of Bogoslowski Crater, a feature that is over 100 kilometers in diameter, and the landing is scheduled between August 21 and 23. The Luna 25 lunar lander is the first domestically produced moon probe in modern Russian history. The mission picked up where the former Soviet Union left off in 1976, when Luna 24 successfully delivered about 170 grams of moon samples to Earth. The 1,750 kg Luna lander has a four-legged base containing the landing thrusters and propellant tanks, and an upper compartment that holds the solar panels, communication equipment, onboard computers, and most of the science apparatus. Luna 25 mission is planned to operate on the lunar surface for a year, conducting a range of scientific experiments and observations with its eight science instruments. The lander is also equipped with a 1.6-meter-long lunar robotic arm to collect the surface regolith to depths of 20 to 30 centimeters. The two primary scientific objectives of the mission are to study the composition of the polar regolith and to study the plasma and dust components of the lunar polar exosphere. If the Luna 25 mission is successful, Russia plans to launch the Luna 26 orbiter in 2027, which will study the moon remotely and map the distribution of water ice on its surface. The Luna 27 lander will again study the regolith and the ice contained in it near the south pole of the moon, but with more instruments than Luna 25. And in the end, Luna 28 should bring the lunar regolith to Earth in 2030. 
Virgin Galactic took its first private astronaut customers on a suborbital space flight on August 10, nearly two decades after it started selling tickets. The mission, dubbed Galactic 02, began on Thursday morning when a giant twin fuselage mothership aircraft took off from a runway at Spaceport America in New Mexico, carrying the spaceplane VSS Unity. The carrier plane climbed to an altitude of about 15 kilometers before releasing VSS Unity, which then ignited its hybrid rocket engine to accelerate to a speed of Mach 3. One minute later, the rocket motor shut down, leaving the crew members weightless as Unity coasted to an altitude of 88.5 kilometers. Unity was commanded by NASA astronaut C.J. Sterko, with Kelly Latimer as the pilot. John Goodwin, who represented Great Britain in the 1972 Summer Olympics, was one of the passengers on the flight. The other two customers were a mother and daughter, Kaisha Shahaf and Anastasia Mayers. The fourth person in the cabin was Beth Moses, Virgin Galactic's chief astronaut trainer, making her fourth suborbital space flight. The crew only had about three minutes of weightlessness before the ship crossed a peak of its trajectory and started falling back to Earth. The space plane then entered back into the dense lower atmosphere and landed on a runway at Spaceport America, officially bringing an end to the mission. The total time between Unity's air launch and landing was just under 15 minutes. Virgin Galactic plans to fly roughly one commercial suborbital space flight per month, and a ticket to ride will cost $450,000. The European Space Agency revealed on August 8 that the inaugural flight of the Ariane 6 rocket will not take place this year. Ariane 6 is a European expendable launch vehicle under development since the early 2010s. The two-stage rocket was initially planned to begin flying in 2020 and ramp up its cadence to seamlessly replace the older Ariane 5 rocket. However, the launcher experienced numerous delays caused by technical issues, the COVID pandemic, and design modifications. According to ESA, the inaugural flight of the long-delayed rocket has been rescheduled for some time next year after a series of engine tests planned in the coming weeks. A short-duration hot-fire testing of the rocket's core stage Vulcane 2.1 engine is scheduled for August 29 at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. A test of the upper-stage Vinci engine is planned for as soon as September 1 at a facility in Germany. Following those tests, there will be a long-duration static-fire test of the rocket's core stage at Europe's spaceport, tentatively scheduled for September 26. Only after that test will ESA be ready to announce a date for the inaugural Ariane 6 launch. Boeing has delayed the first flight of the Starliner spacecraft carrying astronauts to the International Space Station until March 2024, as the company continues to work on issues with the spacecraft's parachutes and wiring. The Starliner crew flight test was scheduled for July 21 and was set to carry two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. However, testing and analyses during the final certification of the spacecraft's parachute system found that soft links on lines connecting the three main parachutes with the capsule are not as durable as anticipated. While it was not an issue during the two uncrewed Starliner test flights in 2019 and 2022, it is possible that the soft linkages could break under heavier stresses, such as if one of the spacecraft's three main chutes does not fully deploy. The other problem that got the attention of Boeing and NASA involves a type of tape called P213, used to protect wiring harnesses throughout the vehicle. Boeing found that the adhesive on the tape is flammable under certain circumstances. Boeing and NASA officials said on August 7 that they are making good progress on the issues, but they still have several more months of work to complete before the vehicle will be ready to carry astronauts. Boeing has modified the parachute soft links, and a spacecraft drop test is planned for the second half of November. Workers have removed about 85% of the P213 tape in the upper part of the spacecraft. In the lower part of the spacecraft, some tape is hard to remove or could cause damage if it is removed. So, engineers have developed protective barriers and coatings to mitigate the flammability hazard. Even though a target launch date has not yet been set, based on the current plans, Boeing expects the spacecraft to be ready for flight in early March next year. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.